Indonesia has more species of plants and animals than almost any other area on the planet, second only to Brazil. But this astonishing biodiversity is under threat. Every year, two million hectares of forest are cut down. Major corporations are turning these precious tropical forests into lucrative single crop farms. It is the equivalent of six football fields disappearing every minute. The deforestation has many victims. Between 80 and 90% of forest species will die as a result of clear cutting. The original forest, bursting with life, is slashed, burned, obliterated, and replaced with orderly rows of palm trees to produce the most widely used vegetable oil in the world, palm oil. Our first stop is the island of Borneo, or Kalimantan. At 736,000 square kilometers, it's the fourth largest island on Earth. At the heart of these lush tropical forests lives a small, remarkably agile tree primate, the gibbon. Its characteristic song has become the forest anthem, a long lament with which it defines its territory. Of the 17 species of gibbons identified in the world, seven live in the forests of Indonesia. All are threatened by the rapid disappearance of their habitat. The forests of Indonesia are home to a large variety of iconic species, like elephants and orangutans. But they struggle to survive in isolated patches of forest. In the last 50 years, Indonesia has lost over half of its forests. Without immediate action to stop the destruction, an estimated 98% of Indonesia's tropical forests could disappear in the near future. We might think Indonesians are seeing some benefit, some improvement to the local economy in exchange for letting their forests that have always been at the center of traditional culture go up in smoke. Not so. Oil palm production requires little manpower and most of the workers on these industrial farm operations earn less than the local minimum wage. But the most astonishing thing when you walk through these giant plantations is the silence. At the foot of the trees are bunches like this that are filled with what you could call the gold of these new Indonesian forests. This fruit is the basis of palm oil. It's very sad to see how life has disappeared from formerly thriving habitats. Fortunately, some people are fighting for change. Like Aurelien Brule, who left his native France at 18 to settle in Indonesia. Aurelien was only 12 years old when he first encountered gibbons. Through the bars at a zoo, he spent many hours observing them. At 16, he wrote his first book on gibbons to the astonishment of specialists. Here, everyone calls him Shani, which means gibbon in Thai. As a child, I wanted to leave France. I wasn't rejecting my country, I just knew it was going to happen. And in May 1998, I ended up in Jakarta and had a rude awakening. Because I'd always dreamt of living with the gibbons, in a little cabin in the woods surrounded by animals, and yet, I quickly saw that if I was going to help them, that wasn't going to happen. I witnessed deforestation on a scale I could never have imagined. The entire forest is being attacked. 90% of the forest had been handed over to the logging companies. So the primeval jungle, the virgin forest, forget it. That only exists on the highest peaks of the central mountains of Borneo. So I had to deal with reality. 
I'd also forgotten that Indonesia has a large human population with complex cultural and societal values. Many people keep gibbons as pets. Gibbons are often killed during deforestation. The baby, clinging to its slaughtered mother's belly, will be captured and sold. Trafficking in wild animals is illegal in Indonesia, but it's still widespread. I understood that saving gibbons was going to be a lot more complicated than my childhood dream, which was to throw open cages and set the animals free. I spent a year negotiating with the forestry department for permission to create the first gibbon conservation program. I had no money. I was 18, a complete unknown. That's when I woke up and saw that to save the gibbons, I was going to have to do it with and for the local people. Welcome to Kalawait. Oh, thanks. In 1998, the Kalawait Association was formed. Today, it's the largest gibbon protection project in the world. We're approaching the first two buildings of Kalawait. The animals are around back. The 147 gibbons, the bears and crocodiles are behind the buildings, so that anyone coming up from the river won't be able to get at them directly. So you're not open to the public? Absolutely not. The only human contact the animals have is with team members. So the idea is to recreate natural living conditions for the animals. That's right, to let them socialize, to let them become gibbons again. They've lived with humans for many years. We pair them off and isolate them together in the forest so they can learn to have a normal social life and basically learn to become gibbons again. Throughout the Indonesian archipelago, we estimate there are 6,000 gibbons in captivity. Where do they come from? From the forest. The mother is killed and the baby clinging to her belly is captured. And they become living playthings. They're toys. People play with them for a while, then stick them in a cage where they die. It's sad, but this is increasingly common. More and more animals are being held in captivity because so many are caught during habitat destruction. So the logger moonlights as a poacher. They cut down the forest, leaving a little stand of trees where the gibbons are easy to catch. Then they sell them. That's why the conditions at Kalawait, even though unfortunately the animals have to be caged, are a world apart from the conditions they were in when they were rescued. This is a socialization cage. We keep the younger ones together in groups like this. Then once they're fully mature, we separate them into mating pairs. Watch it, she's trying to. And the main reason there's not much chance they can be released back into the wild is because there is so little forest left. Yes, where any forest remains, there are already too many gibbons. Any that survive the clear cutting have taken refuge in isolated patches of forest, and since they're very territorial, they're already killing each other. So I can't release these animals. That's what's so frustrating. I came to Borneo 15 years ago to set the animals free, and I'm now keeping several gibbon families caged here at Kalawait because there is nowhere to release them. So more deforestation will only increase the problem. Yes, and that's why Kalawait has to get involved in habitat protection. Not so I can release my gibbons, but so that the gibbons in the forest can stay there. This is Leo. He escaped from one of the cages and attacked another gibbon. It just goes to show that gibbons are extremely aggressive among themselves. His wrist was so badly injured we had to amputate. We have to be on the lookout for it with the gibbons. I can't put more than two adults in an enclosure, and that makes it tricky. With orangutans, you can put 15 or 20 individuals on an island. With gibbons, or a gibbon pair, I can give them 15 hectares, and if I add any more, they'll start to fight. So with this amputation, his chances of ever being released are... He stands almost no chance of ever being released, but that doesn't mean we won't try to find him a mate, another gibbon who can never return to the wild, so that he can have a social life in a large enclosure at Kalawait. We have a sanctuary as well. 25% of the animals here can never be released because of illness or injury. So it's important for us to give them a decent life, even in captivity. 
You're taking a blood sample to see if the gibbon has contracted any human diseases? Yes. We'll find out if the gibbon has hepatitis, for example, or any other strictly human disease. Gibbons often get infected when they're kept as pets. And if they test positive for any of these diseases, they'll never be released. The team at Calloway is made up of veterinarians and local workers inspired by Shani's passion. Around 50 people are employed at the two conservation centers caring for these animals displaced by deforestation. Shani is really committed to saving the world, the animals in the world. I've seen him fight for the last 11 years, and he's completely dedicated. Yes, I am proud to be the part of Kalawit. The good thing about Shani is he's very inspiring, and he's very dedicated in what he's doing, you know, uh, what with uh, Kalawit being growth this huge. Feeding time comes twice a day, and everyone pitches in. Here at the only conservation center in Borneo, over five tons of food, mostly fruit, is served up to the hundred or so captive residents. So this is a different setup. Are they in quarantine? Not anymore. We've set them up as a pair while they wait for a larger enclosure. It's a richer environment and they make a good couple. You can see the female is a bit shyer than the male. And the male is eyeballing us with that typical chewing motion that means, watch it, if you come in here, I'll get you. of living in the heart of the jungle with his gibbon friends. He pictured them free, without bars. That's what he came here for. But in Borneo, Shani soon learned that his childhood dreams were unattainable, that the vast old-growth Indonesian forest he'd imagined were a thing of the past, wiped out by the insatiable maw of big business in cahoots with corrupt officials. These large enclosures stand in for the forest. And the man who dreamt of freedom can't simply open the cage. Today, for Shani and his dedicated team, the only option is saving life where it still exists. We approach with two blowpipes. Only Nanto has a dart, but we confuse her so she won't know where the dart is coming from. That way she'll be in a good position because we need to hit her in the thigh. It's tricky. And this is the latest arrival? Yes, so we need to examine her. Perfect. Perfect. Nanto is a Dayak, and the blowpipe is their traditional weapon. She got the full dose, so she should be asleep in 10 minutes. Here, Jean, help me out. Take her and put her on the table while I take my shoes off. Take one arm and then the other. There, Lin will come with you. She's a white-bearded gibbon. A white-bearded gibbon. <laughs> they have quite a set of teeth. Ah, yes. And as you can see, they cut off her fangs. It's common. When they start to get aggressive, they were cut right through. She should have fangs two to two and a half centimeters long. Captured gibbons that are sold as pets get aggressive as they grow older. So people cut off their fangs in an attempt to control them. 
It's done with a hacksaw without anesthetics, so you can imagine what that's like. But the aggression arises naturally as the animal starts to mature. It's a natural instinct. Yes, at sexual maturity. In the wild, gibbons are rejected by their parents. When they're raised by human parents who don't reject them at maturity, the child has to initiate the separation. The gibbons declare their independence by getting aggressive. The life expectancy of a gibbon in captivity is seven years, max. In the wild, it's 30 years. I'm lucky. I've known what I wanted to do since I was a child. When I was 12, I met one particular monkey in the zoo near my house in the south of France. It was a gibbon. I had a lot of questions because the animals were kept in solitary cages. It seemed wrong to me, and I wondered why. I realized that to be able to help them, I had to understand them. I went to see the zoo director and ended up spending every Wednesday at the zoo. I began to hate seeing the animals in cages. I wanted to travel to see them in the wild, to see real gibbons. I wanted to help them, but I had no tools. I didn't know what I could do. I often say I had to learn to speak gibbon. And that takes time. You need to take the time to observe. And today, I often observe things that I remember from my days as a kid in front of the gibbon cage at the zoo. So that has proven really useful. Because gibbons are unique among animals in that they're monogamous and that they choose each other according to their personalities. So figuring out the gibbon's secret is above all getting to know the personality of each individual. Not giving these animals a second chance. I'm giving them a decent life, which they deserve. They didn't choose captivity. They didn't choose to be caught by poachers. It's our duty as human beings. I'm contributing by having these animals serve as wildlife ambassadors to give us the means and the tools to protect those who are still in the trees. It's a global problem and very complex. The situation in Indonesia is dire. The worst deforestation on the planet is taking place in Indonesia. It's proceeding at an alarming rate, and it makes me so angry. I've been here for 15 years. I remember places that were densely forested. The first Galloway camp was three hours by boat from the nearest village. Today, the plantation is only half an hour away. Once the palm oil plantations are there, it's over. No forest will ever grow there because the soil has been stripped away. In those areas, the forest with all its inhabitants and all its biodiversity is lost forever. Here on the foot, you can see the soil is very moist. Yes. The first thing they do before cutting down the trees is dig canals to drain the forest. They get rid of all the water before starting to cut. So there's a great risk of fire in the dry seasons. The original forest would be flooded at least four times a year. We're right beside the road here. Yes. Usually the companies stay away from the roads, but in this case, they're working with locals, landowners and villagers, to set up plantations along the road. Then the property owners will sell the bunches of oil palm fruit to the companies. Right. So it's not just the great forest that you can see from the road, but there's also cooperation with local farmers. People are pressured to grow oil palms because they know that the nearby companies will buy the bunches from their plantations. So a company that owns 15,000 hectares will be able to harvest fruit from almost double that amount of land. That's sad. Very sad. There's nothing left. No gibbons, no life. Under international pressure, the Indonesian government has created national parks and reserves, but it hasn't made much difference on the ground. The bureaucracy is such that some oil palm plantations operate with impunity inside national parks. The spread of these large corporations leaves very little land for the locals. 
So education has become a real force for changing hearts and minds. To do that, to have a few victories, to save the forest, to save the animals, you can't accomplish anything alone. You need support. Lots of support. And in order to rally people to the cause, the message has to be positive. We need to be able to report victories. Ecology is our future. It's not a quote-unquote pain in the neck, which is how it comes across the media. People go home, turn on the TV and get a lecture. I want to do just the opposite. That's what I do on Radio Callaway. Our message is that ecology is positive, it benefits us all, and it can be fun. Saving an animal is fun. You go to bed at night, damn, today I made a difference. To communicate with the people around, Callaway has its own radio station. Okay, kita mulai lagi dengan Shani di sembilan sembilan koma satu FM seperti biasa kita akan bahas masalah lingkungan. Jangan lupa buat kamu yang piara satwa liar seperti wawa orang hutan beruang ular mungkin jangan sampai menyiksa mereka di kandang biarlah mereka kembali ke alam. Untuk itu hubungi Yayasan Kalawet di nol delapan satu tiga empat sembilan dua satu tujuh sembilan sembilan satu atau langsung datang di kantor Kalawet di lantai pintu nomor dua puluh delapan. Sekarang kita simak lagu favorit kamu dan kita. Kembali setelah kurang lebih empat lima minit. Jangan kemana-mana tetap di sembilan sembilan koma satu. On air for ten years, Kalawait is the number one radio station and actively participates in Indonesian life. The voice of Kalawait is now heard everywhere and broadcasts its conservation message. There's a tremendous lack of information. You mustn't think all Indonesians are bad because they keep gibbons. They're simply uninformed. That's where Radio Callaway makes a difference. When we explain, you know your pet gibbon who died after seven years? It didn't die of old age, but at sexual maturity. That knowledge alone will make some people think and bring us their animals. 99,1 FM, Kalawet Radio, the best, the best music for life. life. Sol the solution is with young people. They're the future, and they'll be making the decisions in a few years. They have the energy to promote Kalawet and go out and save animals. So the primary objective at Radio Kalawet is to be heard. Then we'll start to promote awareness among young people whose main interest is not in saving gibbons. And it's working because over 60% of the animals we get at Kalawet Borneo are from listeners. Listeners are doing our work for us. It's the schoolgirl who says to her friend, I'm working worried you have a gibbon at home you should listen to radio callaway and call them that's how we get animals we're a very small center yet we get a lot of information out and we save a lot of animals because of all these listeners who quote unquote work for us who send us texts emails or call the hotline for us to come and help an animal who's in bad shape. Or who get us to intervene between wild animals and villagers. We recently took in a bear who was on a balcony. Some oil palm workers had captured a bear and were keeping it on a balcony. Some listeners let us know. Because the bear often fell off the balcony. Having all these listeners gives us real power. Because again, we're a small team with very limited means, but we have the support of 10 to 15,000 listeners 24-7 who text us information. Whether it's a bear, a critically endangered crocodile, or a snake, whenever conflict arises between animals and humans, Callaway intervenes to try to find a solution that works for everyone. This is what my life's about, doing positive things around me. I can't do otherwise. I can't explain why. At any rate, I know one thing. When I come home with Prada, with my children, I go to bed at night proud of what I'm doing. I can't explain why, but this is what I'm meant to do. I came to Indonesia to save gibbons, and I stayed because I fell in love with Indonesia. 
because all my little victories, no matter how small, have been won with the support either of the locals or of my team, and obviously all the people around me are Indonesians. So this has truly become my country. I now have Indonesian citizenship, and I'm proud because it gives me a certain legitimacy to say, look, we have to protect the forest, we must. I'm fighting for my country, and that's an additional incentive to be even more effective. One of your essential tools is your paraglider. Yes, it's extremely effective because it takes so little effort. In a single half-hour flight, I can evaluate the situation in a reserve of over a thousand hectares. It would take days on foot to ensure that there was nothing to worry about. I can also keep an eye on areas that are being cleared. This shows a path that was made in the interior. It's the first step before clear-cutting. It's an access to the forest. And there they've started clearing, and you can see what's going on. So that's clear-cutting. And they've also set fibers to be able to cut faster. So that forest is on fire. But there must be a risk of the fires spreading. A great risk, but that's actually what they want, to set a fire and burn as much as possible, so it's easier to burn the forest into a plantation. These fires don't get out of control, they are deliberately set to spread as far as possible. That's why there are dozens of fires lit here and there, so as much as possible will burn. The longer the dry season, the happier the oil palm industry is, because they can, unfortunately, convert the forest more quickly. Isn't it against the law? Absolutely. But this goes on every year in Borneo and Sumatra. The haze will even go beyond the country's border. That's how huge the fires are. In addition to public health issues caused by the ever-present haze in the cities, the forest fires send all the carbon stored in the trees throughout their lifetimes up into the atmosphere. Deforestation is responsible for 20% of annual worldwide greenhouse gas production. When I created this reserve in Borneo, I did it with the authorities, with the locals. It was an ideal conservation organization. Then came elections. Attitudes and interests changed, and they're now cutting down the forest, so we can say goodbye to the animals we released into the wild. What will happen to those animals? I've devoted 11 years of my life to a reserve in Borneo. 11 years of work, money and patrols. Today, as we speak, this forest is being clear-cut. And the orangutans and gibbons who call it home? Sorry. That was the end for me. Now, I don't take risks. I buy the land. If I'm permitted to, under Indonesian law, now that I'm a citizen, I will buy up as much as possible. Even if in terms of conservation, I'm not sure it's the best option. But if we want to be as certain as possible that we can save the forest, we have to buy patches of forest, create private conservation zones. buying the forest to preserve it. With few means, Shani opened a second conservation center in the neighboring island of Sumatra. That's where he's buying up sections of forest and protecting it from attack from big corporations. With 
With a thousand euros, we can save one hectare. A family of gibbons needs 15 hectares. 15,000 euros will save a gibbon family forever. That is very concrete. And if we own the forest, we can put protection measures in place without having to seek authorization from any elected official who may change every five years or lobby authorities for which there is never a guarantee. This is completely different. Someone cuts down a tree on my reserve, it's as if someone came into my house to rob me. I call the local police who do their job. Welcome to Kalawit, Sumatra. At the high point of his reserve, we witness the morning spectacle of a family of wild gibbons. Free on land rich in a variety of species, in the heart of a section of forest protected by Kalawet. It's wonderful because looking down, you can see wild animals, which is almost impossible when you walk through the forest. Yes, it's one of the few places where you can observe wild gibbons at eye level. This is a family of five. And it's great because the male has light-colored fur and the female is black, so you can see patches of color moving through the forest. That young one seems pretty lively. Yes, that's typical of Gibbons. He's almost two, still close to his mother, but he moves around on his own, jumping around to the annoyance of his parents. There's a specific dynamic in terms of their songs. There are two almost identical songs in the same family. Yes, Gibbons use song to protect their territory, but not any song. It's a duet between the male and the female. The female will sing a crescendo that lasts 18 seconds. And if there's a young female, she will try to imitate her mother. Over time, her song will become identical to her mother's. And when her song is perfect, we know she's about to mature. It's the same for a young male. He'll spend time with his father and learn to be a male by imitating dad. So from a distance, even if you can't see them, you can tell how many are in the family, the sex of each individual, and the extent of their territory because they sing all around the borders. What's amazing is to see that the work you do with the cages, with conservation, now allows you to buy sections of forest to protect it. Yes. Thanks to the animals you hear in the background singing in their cages, I can protect the wild ones. This is why I came to Indonesia, to see wild gibbons and protect them. And we're doing just that here at Kalawait Reserve, the forest we bought. I can touch that goal with my fingertips. Saving gibbons means saving trees, which saves all the animals. So that's a priority, especially in Indonesia, where deforestation is moving so quickly. We have no time to lose, and the best way to proceed is to buy up the forest. Shani installs motion-activated cameras to do an inventory of the animals who come to his private preserve. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> a pig-tailed macaque. They stay on the ground. They do. They eat fallen fruit. The camera trap allows us to identify species in the interior. And for large animals like the tapir, to recognize individual animals, so we'll know how many there are. So the cameras are revealing the wealth of the forest. We know how rich the forest is, and the camera lets us show it to others. We've had bears caught on camera. We have videos, photos of the golden cat, an elusive panther. These are little victories that allow us to shout a little louder, hey, help us, because the forest is rich. We have the evidence. Here, look. In Indonesia, the first big victory, and we have the necessary tools to win it, is to ensure that zones protected under Indonesian law, all the existing national parks, all the existing reserves, are well and truly protected on the ground. 
We have the tools we need, the laws on our side. National parks and reserves have already been created. But it's clear to see that in Indonesia, the way the law is enforced is not what people are used to in developed countries. We try to meet the minister responsible for forests, to ask for explanation, to try to understand why conservation measures passed by this government weren't enforced on the ground. We're from Canada. We're filming a TV show about the forests of Indonesia. Yes. Is it possible to, after your talk to just no, ask no, a few no. questions? Because, uh, but after, after your talk? Huh? Just five minutes after your talk? That day, the minister announced another bill in response to international pressure. A plan to reforest areas destroyed by monoculture. The Indonesian president launches a campaign to replant a million trees. It's a joke. Cancel one oil palm company and you'll save way more than a million trees. And you won't have to spend a fortune getting trees, planting them and so forth. It's just a big joke, a farce. This is also a very corrupt country. Indonesia is the fifth most corrupt country in the world, so you have to deal with that. I can't remake Indonesia. My goal is to save Gibbon, save the forest, so I do anything I can to achieve that. Kalawait is a foundation that relies on public donations to survive. Will Shani's howl of distress be heard in our homes? We, major consumers of palm oil, can make a difference. This oil used in food processing, cosmetics, and biofuels can and should be subject to far more effective conservation measures. Respect of habitats and biodiversity should be required of palm oil producing countries before they are granted the right to exploit their forests. The fight against palm oil is crucial not just for the forest of Indonesia, which unfortunately is already severely affected by palm oil. Anything we can save in Indonesia is only a first step. But if we don't organize a defense, an offense against palm oil, then the industry will start the same process of destruction in Central Africa, in Gabon, especially which is renowned for its lush forest. The oil palm corporations are already there, and in Latin America. That's why it's vital to have victories here, so that the pattern doesn't repeat so severely in other countries where palm oil exploitation is in its infancy. Just look at what's happened in Malaysia, which was one of the first countries targeted by palm oil and where little forest is left. The main thing is not to be pessimistic and not keep looking back saying, oh, look at what we've lost, what we're going to lose, it's a disaster. Yes, it is. So you have to roll up your sleeves and that's what I'm doing. Oh, he's scared. That's Tante. As a child, Aurelien Brule had a crazy dream of going to live with gibbons, free, in the heart of the old growth forests of Indonesia. His journey led him to confront a sobering reality where nature is under attack from all sides in the name of short-term profit, no matter what the long-term consequences may be. Far too often, avarice kills life. I can't imagine anyone thinking Callaway is a solution. It's often presented as such. Yes, we're doing amazing work, but we won't save the gibbon. Not the gibbon. We're saving some gibbons. And there's a huge difference. We're not saving the forest. We're saving bits of forest. Fragments, pockets, but if we don't do it, we'll lose everything, so we have to do it. Maybe there'll be a study in 30 years in Borneo and we'll have saved 2% of the forest. Yeah, but it's not all gone. We have to focus on that, because if we don't act now, if nothing is done, we'll lose everything. This man of nature has led the fight of his life, a life dedicated to saving gibbons and the many species that live within the last great forests on the planet. His new dream now allows him to save much more than gibbons. It's allowing other species to survive as well. And in an interconnected world where the fate of one species depends on the fate of others, Shani, in his own way, is also fighting for our survival.